moderator for this panel will be Michael Mayhew, who has 30 years of investment experience, is the founder of Integrity Research, and he is on the board of directors of InvestorSide Research Association, which is a nonprofit uh, organization for the independent research industry. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. So today, we're going to be uh, talking about data engineering. So far today, we've uh, heard panelists discuss the alternative data space. We've heard panelists um, discuss AI. And these are all great and exciting opportunities uh, for the investment uh, research industry and the asset management uh, industry. However, to actually um, uh, take advantage of any of the promise of these technologies and these trends, there really is a lot of hard work that has to be done up front uh, to be able to actually um, take advantage of the data. And so today, we're going to be talking about um, data engineering and, and the data procurement process in this partic particular panel. I have some great panelists here for you. And I'd like each one of them to describe or give, give you a little bit of their background, how they play in the space, uh, and then we'll go from there. Philip. Sure. Thanks very much, Michael, and <clears throat> thank you everyone for your attendance and attention today. Really appreciate it. My name is Philip Britton. I'm the <clears throat> founder and CEO of Crux Informatics, uh, and we are doing something that we think is a blindingly obvious but shockingly overlooked need in the market. Um, I've spent my entire career on the sell side of data and analytics um, as, a, as an entrepreneur. I worked for Bloomberg and for Thomson Reuters, for, headed up Google Finance for a while, and had long seen the struggles that firms have to, to actually make use of all this data that we've been talking about. There is a, a big gap and often underappreciated how much work needs to go into wiring up to a source of data onboarding the data, storing it, structuring it, cleaning it, doing all these things to get data ready before you can even start to do the data science that gets value out of it. Uh, and that's what Crux does. We have a utility for the industry that does this. We do it at scale. We bring economies of scale. We're doing work that's largely done over and over and over again by different firms redundantly. And we do it once on behalf of many clients, bringing cost and time to market advantages uh, to our ecosystem of clients and data supplier partners. Thanks, Philip. My name is Greg Skibiski. I'm the CEO uh, and founder of Thassos Group. And what we do is one very specific thing, uh, which is uh, not completely dissimilar to yours, but in a very specific place. Um, we take raw latitude, longitude, location data that comes out of mobile devices, and we clean it, uh, and we normalize it, and we make industry-specific bundles uh, of friendly, normalized time series data that people can easily evaluate uh, and then implement into uh, different types of trading models. So uh, I would say that uh, you know, versus maybe a lot of vendors that aren't in the actual space where they're delivering the data, uh, you know, our guys really do sit with uh, Bloomberg terminals at their desks and they really do uh, you know, collect KPIs and they do uh, not only back testing but uh, you know, out of sample testing on everything that we do to understand error rates. Um, and a lot of our, our AI machine learning stuff is really about looking at uh, you know, public releases uh, of information and using it to train the models uh, that we have to, that, that do error correction and, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I think we do a lot of the analytics work that would normally be done inside a lot of funds uh, compared to other people that I think, you know, maybe data comes out of the ad tech world or something like that. Uh, and, you know, you have to take it and clean it and normalize it and find the KPIs and wait to do the out of sample testing. Uh, you know, we really try to take it one step further to make it easy for people to, uh, to understand and look at the data, uh, you know, with the finance experts that we have uh, in the house. But again, it's all based on uh, location data from mobile phones. Uh, we have products that are in the um, consumer um, retail space, looking at 150 different uh, foot traffic and other metrics to 150 different US retailers. We have data um, that's on mall REITs, uh, looking at all the publicly traded and non-publicly traded mall REITs, uh, looking at income levels and footfall and things like that to all these different properties. Um, and as well, things like uh, industrial streams, looking at uh, hours worked and productivity at all the factories 
in the U.S., uh, including commodities processing plants and looking at esoteric things like uh, when nuclear power plants look like they're staffing up uh, to, to go online for electricity traders and stuff like that. So we cover basically every gig subsector uh, in one way uh, or another. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm the chief data scientist at UBS Asset Management. Um, and so uh, our team's objective is to add machine intelligence to the investment process. So we work a lot with fundamental analysts, um, uh, portfolio managers, CIOs, to kind of basically think about how do we leverage all these great data sets that are out there as part of our investment process. Um, and so why am I on an engineering panel? Like, as Mike said, I totally agree that like engineering is, is the thing, like when you're kind of in a data space, that's the thing that actually makes it work. Yeah. Somewhere the rubber's got to hit the road. And, um, and so from what I hope I can add is one for sort of like the allocators in a room is to say, hey, what kind of questions do I want to ask if I think about like as I do my operational due diligence, what kind of questions can I ask um, and that helps me like differentiate sort of like the leaders from the laggards um, in terms of like the, the sort of engineering data space. Um, for the vendors, hopefully I can sort of add a little bit of perspective um, from, from sort of like a data consumer side in terms of like how they can improve their product and, and also sort of encourage other um, uh, asset managers in the room to kind of like help collaborate in terms of in, in this data space. I'm actually sort of um, not super competitive. I, I sort of feel like a rising tide lifts all the boat. I think by kind of working together, we can actually grow the space as a whole. Right. Thanks. So, um, Norm, I'm going to start with you, but I'd like the whole panel to address the question. Um, clearly, as a data consumer, as a data vendor, and as someone really involved in the nuts and bolts of the data engineering right, and integration, um, you probably have seen a lot of the problems uh, involved in the data procurement and engineering process. So, Norm, why don't you tell us a little bit about the biggest problems that you've seen, and um, we'll talk about solutions later, but you know, what, are the, what are the things that the people in the audience need to focus on? Yeah, um, so I think, I mean, just sort of like from my seat, I guess, the big problem, obviously, is sort of discovery, and, and that's, that's somewhat been solved, so I'm sort of going to skip to like the, the engineering part of it. Uh, I think sort of Philip already mentioned quite a few things. He's going to talk more. Um, so I'm going to sort of specifically focus on some of the problems in terms of like, so um, getting data from a vendor that's not machine readable, like somebody sends some like disgusting spreadsheet that, you know, maybe is even nice for a fundamental analyst, but it's not great for us from an engineering perspective. Um, doesn't have any sort of point in time data, like um, doesn't, I, I'm not, I don't care too much about ticker mapping. Um, a big problem tends to be, and this is really hard to solve, is just the nature of the data sets right now is, is a short history. Um, so like one data set that I work with, um, only is data starting in like mid 2015, I think, and it's for Asian companies who only report sort of semi-annually, but the consensus is only available for like on an annual basis. So really, I've only got like one data point that I can look at, so that's pretty horrible. Yeah. Um, so, so I think those are some of the like, key challenges, and I'm sure we're going to get into the other stuff sure. in terms of like data schema changes and all that fun stuff. Greg. Yeah, I think we, uh, you know, have made a lot of effort to uh, look. I mean, when you're analyzing geolocation data from mobile phones, it's probably one of the most noisy, difficult to work with, um, you know, error-prone data sets that that you can really find, right? I mean, everybody implements something differently. They keep changing it. Nobody documents the changes. <laughs> um, it is a really enormous pain in the ass, right? But on the other side, uh, you know, it's so highly dimensional and it covers so many different things um, that you know what we're trying trying to do is just, just to do a lot of work that anybody could do themselves, right? So if you think of this sort of, um, you know, the world of, of what a, a buy side fund looks like, you, you know, the, the, with the scarcest amount of time really is the person who has to take all the different information sources in the fund 
and put them together, right? I mean, that's what a fund is, right? Is to get, get information, decide intelligently how to combine it together, right? Um, but nowadays, uh, and I think for the last few years, it's really been a mess in the market that everybody's been spending their time doing stuff not that. And I would even make a bet that that's impacted the performance of, of funds overall, being completely distracted by looking at all these different types of, um, you know, data that, that just, you know, they have to scratch their head and get their head around this, you know, multidimensional thing, which is completely different than the last one then, right? So, you know, we, we've seen a lot of problems in that area, and I think that, you know, we've been a, a vendor that's really tried to get stuff to the to the easy to use and to the easy to um, ingest side, and I think that, you know, vendors like Crux coming into the space as well, um, you know, you can even do stuff that we're doing right now, and we'd be happy for you, you know, to take it off of our plate, right? Because we've got enough to do, you know, working with the core geolocation data set. So I feel like there really is a space in this market for, um, you know, kind of this information supply chain, I know that we were discussing on our previous call, um, really to make it easy for people to do what is their core competency, right? Which is to take this information, understand it as quickly as possible, and decide how to combine it together in their mosaic, uh, you know, to, to decide whether it's, you know, usable uh, or not. Yeah, ab absolutely. Fully agree with my colleagues up here. It's the, the amount of effort and work that goes into finding and then ingesting and wrangling data sources and operating them is, is highly overlooked. Um, you know, a lot of firms have gone out and hired teams of data scientists because they want to start doing big data and doing machine learning and getting value out of data, only to find, those data scientists find, they're spending 80% of their time reading file specs from vendors, doing very basic wire up kind of work, checking data, rationalize, mapping identifiers that one vendor uses that are different than what a different vendor uses, and uh, this real nuts and bolts stuff before they can even get to the data science that they were really hired to do. And, uh, and I think that this has been um, completely sort of under, underestimated how hard this is, and it's very hard. Uh, you've got, you know, the smallest funds out there are taking in, in dozens of different data sources. Large ones are taking in thousands of different data sources from a multitude of vendors, each of, one, each of whom delivers the data in a different format, some via API, some via, via FTP file drops through all kinds of other methods. They use different standards for the way they, they store the data, different ways they represent uh, items in the data. The date and time, for instance, might be different in different data sets. So even to put those two data sets on the same chart, let's say, you have to map how the date times are, form are represented in one of those data sets to the way it is in the other. Well, all these little details add up to a huge amount of work. And then there's the operational part, um, which is these data feeds are coming in, could be daily, frequently, could be monthly, could be secondly, uh, and somebody has to watch the feed. And when it goes down, if you have a data feed you know, that's become an integral part of your research and investment process, that data has to show up every day, and it has to be correct. It can't be missing things. It can't be wrong. Um, if the underlying representation of the data, the schema has changed, you need to, to react to that. And so there's a tremendous operational load on watching these feeds and dealing with issues, uh, whether it's a network issue or a data messed up issue or they change something without telling you issue. It's, uh, it's constant. And again, firms usually underestimate how hard that is and how much effort goes into it. Right. If I could just add one quick thing to that, um, I think once you get to the next level as well with the, with the KPIs, right, that's the next thing you want to do is find the KPI and test it against some KPI. We see in a lot of cases people will take our data and they'll say, well, that doesn't seem to be very predictive of the price. And like location data is not supposed to predict price, right? It's supposed to predict the number of people in the building. Right? So you need to test it against what it's purporting to measure and not what you want it to measure. Right? So you know, it also takes people a lot of work. You give them the data and then they're like, oh man, you know, like I have to do all this? Uh, yeah, you got to go through all the filings. You got to dig out. You got to find the KPIs. You got to back out of the numbers and figure out that this was an international channel and this was you know, Golf, Galaxy, Ga Golf Galaxy and not like you know, Dick stores. Um, and then once you do all that work to back out the KPI that your specific data set is purporting to measure, well, then you're just at the very beginning, but then people see that step and they're just like, oh, God, another huge amount of work. Yeah, then they have to figure out how to go from number of visitors in the store to sales and revenue and when that's going to hit the market and when eventually how the stock price is going to be affected maybe 
a month from now, for instance, or exactly. whatever, it may, whatever it may be. So, so we've started talking a little bit about all the problems, and we could probably go on and on and talk about the various problems in dealing with uh, procurement, ingestion, engineering, all that kind of stuff. Because, Philip, you, you've, you've, you've talked uh, ad nauseum at, at a lot of different conferences about all these issues. Um, but what are some of the solutions, some of the best practices, some of the, um, the industry movements you guys have started to see that might help address a particular problem that you're seeing in the marketplace? Um, you know, or, or are there none yet? You know, are there problems out there that, they, that really should have a solution, but you're not seeing the industry move yet? So I'm happy to, to jump in there. I think there are a number of bits and pieces that are coming together as, as firms become more sort of cognizant and aware of some of these issues. Um, we've seen uh, a few firms starting to, to help on the, the finding of data sets. So there are a few marketplaces. Um, Greg made a, made a reference to that. Um, and um, actually, Norm did, sorry. Uh, and so there are a few places you can go to start to see what's out there, and it becomes a little easier to find, particularly smaller data sets than it used to be. Obviously, just the web is a, is a huge benefit there. There's a whole bunch of tools vendors coming out. You find ETL tools. You're finding, obviously, a whole slew of big data tools, cloud services. Um, there are some professional services. So there are a bunch of pieces kind of around this that are starting to attack the problem, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, in the introduction, I've been shocked that no one has sort of attacked the part that, that we're hoping to address with uh, Crux, which is providing a managed service right at the middle of, of that core uh, data engineering piece of the puzzle. So um, I would add to that, I mean, yeah, you're right. There, there's been a number of good tools out there, I think sort of like, the improvement in like pandas that the guys from like IQR actually open sourced, um, and uh, and so like the improvements in, in R, I think sort of have gone a long way to solving part of that problem. A um, couple of things I would mention in terms of like best practices, just for sort of like the vendors out there. So like I said, like give me machine readable data, give me like so sort of like the full history of your data set, um, and this tends to be a discussion point with vendors where they say, well. We don't want to give you the full history, but like, I'm like, well, without the full history, I can't really see if your data set's any useful or not. And, and unlike sort of maybe a corporate that actually gets something useful out of like seeing the full history, to me that's pretty useless because, you know, we want to make decisions today. I can't, can't buy a stock like, you know, three months ago. Um, so so kind of give me like the full history, just cut it off at some point, like that sort of goes a long way. Uh, give me a schema when you deliver data. I don't want to see CSVs, like give me parquet files, anything like that. Um, docs we've mentioned, like uh, I think uh, FactSet, for example, is one of the sort of uh, better, if you can get your hands on, on one of their documentations, like they're actually really good uh, reads. Um, and then last thing I'll probably mention is sort of reproducible case studies. So if a vendor comes in and says like, hey, we get something done great with your data, like just give it to me in a digestible format, like R, Python, MATLAB script, whatever it is, like, so I can kind of see like, hey, yeah, this is how I take your data and this is how I kind of get to that point that, that kind of helps us like um, prove this a lot. Um, and yeah, I think in general, sort of as much as the industry can, can move towards sort of like, and, and hopefully we're going to be sitting here in a year from now and we've got more of that like sort of open and shared like standards and best practices, I, I think it would be really helpful. Right. Yeah, I think that um, uh, one thing that we've done to try to make it uh, easier for folks is uh, work with uh, some of the big partners. So we have a, a number of partnerships that are not announced yet in the space, but you can imagine some of the biggest um, you know, data um, companies uh, in the world that deal in you know, financial markets. Uh, you know, we, we think that that's a validation uh, to be on their platform. Uh, I think one of the problems has been just, you know, people look around and look around and look around and they just, you know, don't know what's good and what's not. Uh, when we launched Thassos, uh, about three months later, 
there's about 35 other companies in the market that were in the ad tech space that came out of location-based ad tech. And you know what? The majority of them, within three months, had a PowerPoint deck that looked nicer uh, and more valuable than, than ours, right, about the, this data. And we've been doing this for seven years, and we do nothing but this, right? So um, it's really hard to, to see sort of the signal from the noise. And I think some of the big partners getting in the space are going to help a lot with that and just save the time of the, of the people who this the most valuable time, which is in the funds. Um, and I think, um, uh, as well, just trying to take the, the data more down, down the path, closer to, to you know, the investable side, you, you really have to prove to people that they should be looking at your data. And like, for example, uh, when we, we do like the industrial streams product, looking at um, hours worked in factories, we provide analyses. Uh, and I don't know if you saw, on the, on, there's a, our data on Tesla is on the front page of the Wall Street Journal on Friday, looking at hours worked in the factory. So we really take it to that level uh, you know, to show people that, you know, hey, I'm an industrial PM. I don't usually look at this data. I don't usually have a data scientist, but wait, it really does look like you know the hours work can predict uh, revenue uh, in certain cases. Maybe I should look at it, right? Take it a little farther. Try to prove it to these guys. Um, and some people might say, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't be delivering your data so widely. Maybe there's going to be you know alpha decay uh, in it. But you know, I'm not so sure about that. I think that, for example, in our cases, the the data that we're delivering is so highly dimensional, even if you get it from a huge partner, um, that it really does have a lot of decision making. And, and smart stuff and mosaic effects and stuff that you need to do with the data, even if every single person had the data that, that we have, like in our mall streams product, um, every single person would use it in a slightly different way. Uh, and some people would use it in very, very different ways. So uh, I, I think that the big partners getting this space is, is actually saving everybody a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of other questions uh, here, but I'd like to open it up for any questions from the audience for um, any of our three panelists or all of them. Yep. Um, my question is more about the KPIs. Um, do you have trouble when uh, they're not consistently reported and also with uh, not having you know, estimates by analysts on those KPIs? Yeah, it's definitely a problem. So you start looking at non-US stuff, for example, uh, where they do all kinds of different reporting. Um, yeah, that's an issue, absolutely. Uh, you know, we do the best we can. Uh, but at least, you know, we're doing it instead of the fund having to sit there and be like, hey, why don't I put KPIs uh, uh, in place for this completely new data set that I've never even looked at before? Maybe I don't even want to work with, right? And then, you know, you did all that work just for, for one single thing. I mean, the vendor should probably provide that. Any, any other questions from the audience? Okay. Um, Philip, uh, I know that you've talked an awful lot about the information supply chain. Um, explain, and you know, we talked about it on our call the other day. Um, explain to the audience, number one, what that is, and number two, why they should care about it. What's important about it? Yeah, it's the, the we use the, the idea of the information supply chain really as an explanatory framework and uh, a way to sort of bring awareness to something. And that is, <clears throat> if you think about a financial institution, any financial institution, regardless, buy side, sell side research, their core manufacturing process of that institution is to take in information about the world, do analysis, and arrive at some unique insight that they can use. That insight might drive trading, it might drive investing, it might drive risk management, it might drive customer relationship, it might drive research, et cetera, different outcomes. But fundamentally, every financial firm is, it has this core manufacturing, if you will, process of driving insight. And the raw materials that go into that are, of course, all this data, all this information about the world that, uh, is the, that underlies the an analysis and the insight. And so if you think about that <clears throat> as the core manufacturing of a firm and the information as the raw material, you really need to think about that information as a supply chain. And if we look at the way that, that firms have been acting, you know, thinking about information over the last you know, decade or two, we might say that they've been basically in the hunter-gatherer phase of evolution, running around saying, oh, that looks interesting. Let me grab all, let me get some geolocation data. Let me figure out how to pull that in and sort of, and it's a lot of scrambling and there's a lot of sort of ad hoc wiring up and a lot of ad hoc data science. And so what we're saying is people should realize what it is and that's their supply chain. It's no different from a manufacturing firm thinking about all the raw materials and components and services that they need to bring in to build a car, whatever it may be, and think about information the same way and, and try to get to a more sophisticated um, view of that and start to think about how pieces of what they do 
in-house, therefore, can be pushed out into the supply chain, that there's a little bit of a disaggregation, and with it, uh, an increase in efficiency uh, that can go on when you start to push specialized tasks out into uh, firms that are specialists within your supply chain, whether it's providing specific kinds of data, doing particular kinds of analysis um, that's very deep, or whether it's somebody providing a broad service to help you get some horizontal scale across your efforts, like what Crux is doing. Um, we believe firms should be thinking about uh, their information in this with a supply chain mentality. Great, thanks. So, so Norm, um, you and I talked about the fact that there are a lot of allocators in the room, okay? And so the question I have for you is, how do you as an allocator, um, you have a fund come and they say, yeah, we're in alternative data, we've got data scientists, we're doing all this stuff. And how do you know as an allocator, what kind of questions do you need to be asking to, to determine which guys are real and which guys are just making it up? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good one. I'm I'm assuming there's a lot out there, and sort of we got a fund of funds group at UBS, and they actually came to me and they said, "Hey, well, you know, got this guy coming in. Like, what what do we ask?" Um, and and just to kind of start it off with like the engineering side, going back to it being sort of core. Like, if if you're not sort of investing in like good engineering side, you're not going to be able to like attract good data scientists, right? So if you're there kind of with like Windows desktop computers and Microsoft like SQL databases, no offense, I don't think there's any from Microsoft here, but the, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to attract the data scientists that, that you want to have on your team. Um, I, I think the sort of like key thing I want to ask is like how, how well is the data scientist integrated into the investment process, right? Like what, like, what specifically do they do? Do they, is it sort of like some guy with like two years worth of experience, uh, you know, kind of runs some risk reports? Are they actually working side by side, the fundamental analyst? And they've actually got sort of really good feedback cycle between, you know, the data scientist, fundamental analyst comes, comes in with a question, data scientist sort of goes away, prototypes something, um, and they sort of like keep iterating through that cycle as opposed to kind of, you know, somebody coming in saying, oh, you know, I found some geolocation data, it looks really amazing, and the guy goes, yeah, I'll take a look, great, thank you, like, um, which, which unfortunately kind of tends to happen a lot. Um, I think you can really see it from the senior management perspective as well. If you're sort of like, as a fund, you're committed to the space, if you kind of look at the likes of Code 2, for example, they, they've spent a lot of time, money, and resources to kind of really build out that function. They didn't just sort of like hire like one guy to run some risk reports. They're saying like he really committed to this, like it's gonna be core of our investment process. Like, um, and I think the sort of like the gold standard for this stuff is to say like, hey, you can, um, you're sort of, as an analyst or PM, you're like forced to look at the data. So you can say, hey, I looked at the data, but I disagree with it, which is totally fine, but you have to have looked at it. You can't just say, ah, I think this is nonsense. Like, I'm never gonna look at, you know, I'm, with, I'm, a, I'm a REITs investor, and I'm totally never gonna look at, like, more REITs, like, mobile location data, um, which, which is obviously, like, super important. So you can sort of disagree, but don't ignore. Sure. Just sure. a quick thing to add, you know, we've seen some crazy stuff uh, happening in the market where, you know, the decision maker might have been, in a certain case, the data scientist, right? And so the data scientist looked at our data, which is like nice time consistent, uh, you know, daily time series data, and they were like, yeah, that's not the data I'm looking for. And what do you mean? Did you test it? No, I'm looking for something deeper, you know, that I can, that I can really dig my teeth into. So the decision point was not, you know, the, the, the decision point was like, where can I look like I'm, you know, not too deep, but not this light, but, you know, just the right kind of data that I could have like a three to six month project to really look good because mm -hmm. I mined that and I, I can build some machine learning models on that. So, you know, there's just been a lot of weird stuff like that in the market that, that we scratched our head at. Right. That's, that's interesting. But I, you might have the opposite too, where like, you have a fundamental guy who looks at some data set and it's it's pretty dirty. It's you know it's like it's like a ton of shit in some CSV file. And the guy is like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Like this isn't nicely presented. So they might pass on that. And that's sort of what I'm saying. That sort of data science, like investment integration, is really important. You really got to have both sides at the table. So before uh, I go to my last question, I want to open up to the audience again, see if the audience has any questions for this panel. Okay. 
So guys, if um, you all have a crystal ball, uh, take a look at the industry, the alternative data industry, five years down the line. And again, each of you is coming at it from a different perspective. So I would expect slightly different views on this. Where do you see the, the business being? Um, and how, um, how is it going to be for an investor to kind of consume and actually get value out of this kind of data? Um, so from my perspective, uh, a couple of thoughts. Like one is, I'm kind of hoping in five years from now, there's, there's going to be sort of more products that have like alt data incorporated in them. Like I think sort of like today, you can probably invest in a fund that leverages like alt data in some way, but there's nothing for me to say like, hey, I, you know, I want to have like a REIT ETF that leverages like mobile location data, right? Like how can we build some products around that? Mm -hmm. um, I've also, when I sort of talk to like our sales folks, I've, I've really sort of, I always ask them like, oh, who, you know, are your clients asking for like alternative data, what we're doing in the space and all that stuff. Um, and I've seen very little of that. So I'm kind of hoping that the, the allocators will get more educated and sort of like ask people like, what are you doing in data science? How are you leveraging data sets? Um, kind of create some demand from that perspective as well. Right. Um, I think that should do it. Oh, well, and then hopefully better data delivery and, and all that good stuff. Right. Yeah, I guess, um, first of all, that was an excellent answer. That was going to be my answer. Um, so Sorry, man. <laughs> no, really, really, really good job. Uh, but no, I mean, you know, we're, we're really early right now uh, in this world. And I know it feels like all the data, uh, you know, sources are in some data market and everyone's looking at them and that's all there's going to be and that's it. But it's, it's not the case. I mean, we're at the very, very beginning right now where, you know, to get the value out of this kind of data, Right now, you need basically a data scientist, and you probably need a lot of them because there's so much stuff you got to look at and clean, and like it's it's a mess, right? So we got to move that from uh, you know I need a data scientist to extract this value to you know I can get this value perhaps from looking at a website, right? And maybe you know that that's a direction. You know you do some research, download some stuff, um, you know that that moves in the right direction. But to your point, it's definitely going in the you know direction of um, you know making stuff that people can buy with money because anybody can you know if you have money you can buy this value somehow right so the banks are going to be taking the stuff and what do banks do they make products that they can sell right or they make investable indices or something like this where they, they're getting commission uh, you know when people people trade on it so they're going to be taking all of this and making it products that all you got to do is have money and an opinion uh, you know and you can you can you know participate in this landscape um, but a lot of this stuff I think isn't going to be all data that much longer right so our, our malls product um, you know never before has anybody seen foot traffic to 100% of the malls in the country. Uh, forget about income level and the loyal customer base and um, you know other stuff like that that's detailed. Nobody even knows how many people are going to the mall in the year 2018, right? It's kind of ridiculous that that's what AI is uh, used for, right? And you can argue, you know, is the foot traffic at a mall alternative data? Perhaps you know the foot traffic going to a major commercial mall. Maybe that is a ma you know important fundamental of the business. Right. Um, so I think a lot of stuff is going to go in that direction. Sorry, just to jump jump in there. If you take nothing else away from this talk, it's get more money to buy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I I agree. I think we're very much at the, the early early days of this, and I also agree that the, this distinction um, between traditional data and alternative data will grow fuzzier and, and disappear. I think in five years' time, we won't draw that distinction at all. I think. Uh, if we believe today that as a society we are generating and capturing a prodigious amount of data, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're just at the beginning. It's going to be astounding the volume of data that's going to be coming at it. People are going to be measuring everything, plus all kinds of new activities we do. I mean, look at social media is generating data that didn't exist before. Um, and uh, along with that, of course, the data industry itself, well, like all industries, there'll be winners, there'll be companies and data sets that are productive and valuable, and they'll be successful long term. They'll, there will, as in any industry, be many, many that just don't make it. 
uh, either as a, the data set isn't valuable enough or the company, for whatever reason, just didn't make it. There'll be consolidations, there'll be turnover, there'll be all that usual churn. But the industry will mature through all of that. And um, you know there will be a tremendous amount of innovation that will come along on both the data side and also the machine learning and, and data science techniques that uh, accompany that data. And we're going to see a lot of interesting new ways that people get value out of existing data as well as out of the new data. And um, we're going to see a lot of processes. Hopefully, we'll see a little bit more standardization. It's a little bit Wild West right at the moment. Um, and we think a little bit more standardization across ways that people do business, ways that people package their data, ways that people um, talk about data and use data. And just, just to that, I mean, really the point should be to get the investment managers back to doing what they do, which is like take information, combine it, and make decisions. Anything Absolutely. that's not doing that is wasting their time. Push it out to the supply chain. I, I, yeah, I mean, although I would say is we're, we're still like very much fighting the adoption gap with um, sort of the adoption battle with like the fundamental guys. <laughs> They're saying, hey, it's like, you know, uh, whatever, geolocation data is noisy. Like, I'm, I'm just going to look at like yields and all the stuff I've been looking at for many years. Like, I don't, you know, so we're, we're I think there's still sort of many people kind of um, really have to get to that point of saying, hey, yeah, I want to look at all this data because I think it's relevant. Like, we're, we're still spending a lot of time, like, educating people around the value add of, of all that stuff. Sure, sure. Well, I want to thank you, panelists, and please give uh, our panelists a, a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.